Kyle's introduction, I think, did uh, more than anything else. The only extra part of uh, bona fides I will give you is uh, I did have ramen for lunch today. Uh, and I'm fairly certain I'm getting dragged to have ramen for dinner tonight, which I think may largely be based on the fact that I am giving this talk. But uh, I counted a win right there. So we're doing pretty well right there. Uh, secondly, I'll, I'll tell you, um, this is a talk about a metaphor. And I'm always curious about how people come to doing talks and, and what the point of it is. And I'll, I'll actually tell you this one. I was going on a job interview, and they said, we want you to do a talk as part of the interview. And I said, oh, that's cool. And I'm sitting around with my friends, and I'm going, what should I talk about? And one friend says, well, you should talk about you know, work and tell them about threat intelligence, whatever they want you to do. And another friend of mine says, uh, you should do ramen. You should make ramen and tell them about it. And then my wife goes, but can you do both? So here it goes. First of all, what is ramen? Has anybody had ramen? OK, for those of you who have your hands up, no, keep them up, keep them up. For those of you who have your hands up, how many of you have only had the type of ramen Kyle mentioned, the little like 16 cent, you know, comes in a brick? OK. How many people have had like good, big ramen that gets made? OK, a little bit more people. Funny story, the, the like in a brick ramen is not kind of as cheap and terrible as we think it is. It's actually a really interesting problem that was being solved. So post-World War II, the uh, Americans were show, had shown up in Japan and brought bread, because it's what Americans eat. So we brought bread. Turns out people in Japan didn't eat a lot of bread. They eat noodles. And they, in fact, would generally have a local place they could go and get noodles. But has anyone made noodles? It's hard. It's a lot of work. And it turns out it was mostly a young man's kind of thing to put in the effort to make noodles. Well, you're just post a huge war. So it turns out you don't have a lot of working young men around. So a guy by the name of uh, Momofuko Ando came up with this idea of making these noodles and then frying them. And what the frying did was took all the moisture out, and that actually made them so that they could just send them to people. They were shelf-stable, which anyone will tell you, fresh noodles are not shelf-stable. Those little packs that we think of as just cheap stuff you eat when you're in college literally fed Japan for like 10 years. It's actually a really cool thing. Uh, but that's ramen. It's a, a Japanese soup based on a Chinese noodle. There's a lot of varieties. We could talk about that. I'm happy to nerd out on it. So that's kind of a hard question. Um, what's threat intelligence? I think that's a harder question to answer in some cases, but I love being here and seeing people answer it. To me, it's about a process by which we try to understand our adversary and then tailor our defense to it. Those two things don't seem to have a lot in common, but, but I think there's some, there's some things that we can put together. Ultimately, in this case, I'm going to teach you about Raman and Threat Intel with the idea of, just, of understanding the combination of tools, people, process, inputs, and I know I moved those around, but it's in my head, that, that makes a threat intelligence capability and also that makes a delicious soup. So uh, I, it's a good thing I'm the last talk of the day. I think Jennifer did that on purpose because I'm hoping you'll be hungry by the end. So first, let's talk about tools. Um, I added a lot of definitions to this. Coming up with a definition for the word tools, like it's such a fundamental thing. What's a tool? Well, if you ask Merriam-Webster, uh, it's something, such as instrument or apparatus, used in performing an operation or necessary in the, pr in the practice of a vocation or profession. That's like the most abstract thing ever. It's, it's essentially saying it's a thing you use to do a thing. Which is accurate, and I couldn't come up with a better definition, but it's, it's pretty abstract. And a lot of what we're going to talk about is those types of very abstract concepts. But think about your tools. So what about for making ramen? What are the tools you need? And I'm going to do this kind of back and forth thing here. Uh, so for the ramen recipe that I'm going to share with you, we have a couple different tools that we need. Uh, tongs are pretty necessary because it's you know, boiling hot liquid. You don't really want to reach in there. Uh, ladle, spider, uh, knives, but then there's even some basic infrastructure. Do you have the ability to heat water? Things like that. But what about your tools for cyber threat intelligence? What are you using? Have you, th have you thought about how those fit into what your needs are and what the actions you're taking are? Um, oh, by the way, 
one extra little kitchen tool that's great, the infrared thermometer. If someone would have told me I have a laser gun in the kitchen, it I would have never believed it, but that's exactly what this is. I really should have brought it because it would have made a nice, you know, I guess I can use this, but I could have brought that instead. Anyway, totally recommended. Tools for CTI, what do we got? First of all, uh, I think when you talk about, when we think about cyber threat intelligence tools, what a lot of us think of first is a, a threat intel platform. Well, all it is is a database. And that's simply based on the idea that in a lot of cases, in my perspective, what we call cyber threat intelligence is literally just incident response where we wrote stuff down and referenced it over again. The, the number of cases where I look at an incident take place and someone goes, yeah, I think we might know something about that. Having records and knowing what you know about that a previous incident that might be related is incredibly important. So for that, we have something like a tip. Uh, I just put up some examples of ones that I've used that are kind of quick to get going. If you have something that fits this bill, use that, that's great. If you don't, I'd consider something like Yeti. A workbench, something that lets you manipulate the intelligence you do have available. Something that lets you pull in information from lots of different places, use it to build conclusions. Uh, an, another kind of cool workbench tool, if you haven't used it, is uh, Time Sketch for understanding temporal as opposed to graph based. But are you, are you thinking about what tools you have available to help you understand the intelligence you're pulling in from all your different sources to come to conclusions? Do you know what tools you're using for detection? Two of my favorites are, are Yara and Snort. Uh, Yara for doing file based things, Snort for doing network based things. Um, understanding how those fit in with what you can deploy inside your environment. Uh, and lastly, you know, places you can pull third party information from. I, I'm a big fan of Passive Total and Shodan. But the key to this is not any of the individual tools, it's the understanding of how they work together and how I can use them to answer questions that I have on a routine basis. If someone comes to me and says, hey, here's this IP address, what do you know about it? I know how I can use these tools to fit together, to gather that information and put it into the right place. We'll talk about that process in just a second. The ultimate key to tools is fitting into your environment. To go back to the ramen analogy, I can have the best chef's knife ever, and I can buy three of the best chef's knives ever. Does that help me if I need to reach into a boiling hot pot of water? It's about how those tools fit together. It's about being able to use them to accomplish a goal and understanding what that goal is. Uh, I like quotes. I like quotes from smart people, and in this case, I was able to find a bunch of quotes from chefs. And so Daniel Belud uh, famously famous said, Remember, it's never the knife's fault. Um, I have been in too many environments where people have blamed their tools for not being able to accomplish their goal. Uh, I have also been in environments where someone with just a Python prompt has been able to do everything that all those tools I just showed you could do. You have the ability. It's all about understanding how it fits in with your environment. Uh, also, fun story about Daniel Belude. Um, favorite, I, I was listening to him on a podcast, and he asked about his favorite like guilty pleasure food. Walking taco. Really? Come on, walking taco for a three Michelin star chef? That's crazy. Okay, fine. I guess a big fan of the walking taco. All right. It's so going along with this idea, the ingredients that you're gonna use for your dish, whether that's Intel or, or ramen. Um, the definition of an ingredient. Again, one of those weirdly abstract things where we all kind of know what it is, but do you know like how to describe it? Uh, it's simply something that enters into a compound or is a component part of a combination or mixture. That's again one of those weirdly abstract ideas that's just so kind of, it's a thing that goes into a thing and makes a new thing. Okay, pretty simple. For ramen, uh, like my photography work back there, uh, we have a couple different things. We have some apples, we have some garlic, we have some diced ginger, a uh, bunch of onion because onion's delicious. In this case, it is what is uh, a, a vaguely uh, shoyu style ramen, which means it's soy sauce based. So we've got a bunch of soy sauce and uh, I'm sorry for anyone who wanted to make this and is a little bit on the vegetarian side because it does involve a half rack of baby back ribs. 
Uh, it's also ramen, so you're going to need noodles. Uh, I recommend you can just buy them online. They're super great, easy to find. They keep forever. Thank you, Momofuku Ando. Uh, and then there's a couple different extras that I like putting in mine. I like using kombu, which is a, a dried seaweed. I like using uh, dried shiitake mushrooms. Sweet potato, if you're a sweet potato fan, fantastic. Uh, and it, I also like using green onions for a lot of things, so just chuck the ends in there. It turns out you're making a soup. Just throw everything in together, it's great. Uh, there's some extras that you can generally add as, you put it at, as you're, you're putting your soup together at the end, and we'll talk about that process in a second. Uh, I really like slow poached eggs. It's like a, just kind of gooey and falls apart in a soup. It's great. Uh, sriracha, more of that sweet potato. I like the sweet potato so much I put it on here twice. All right. What about for threat intelligence? Are you thinking about, as you're, okay, I know I'm stretching an analogy here, but are you thinking about it a little bit? Are you thinking about what your ingredients are for threat intelligence? What are the things that you're putting together to get to uh, an end goal? I'll tell you some of my favorites. My own incidents. I mentioned this a little bit already with a tip, but the number of companies that seem unable to remember things that happened to them six months ago is crazy to me. If, if you're not starting your blacklist with IP addresses from the last incident you dealt with, uh, you're, you're hamstringing yourself. So take your own incidents, enrich them, understand them, and use that as part of your own detection, and use that as part of your continued enrichment moving forward. Your own teams. I used to work at Symantec, uh, and I, I was part of what we called global threat operations before there even was a CTI thing. And one of the very best sets of information I got is twice a day, because we were on a shift schedule, so once for each shift, I'd go downstairs and talk to the analysts, who were the ones actually looking at you know, individual attacks as they were going on, and saying, what's been interesting? What's useful today? What's, what's surprised you? And the number of times that someone would say, hey, we saw this weird thing, I, I didn't have enough time to look into it, that ended up leading to something really useful was shocking to me. So especially as a CTI analyst, take the time to get to know the teams who are in the, in the thick of it, in the weeds, dealing with it day to day, and listen and follow up on the things that they share with you. Oh, vendor reports. I have a love-hate relationship. But taking the time to at least exploit these, understand what's there, save the information, is definitely a worthwhile process. Oh, I'm actually surprised. We ha haven't had a whole lot of honeypot discussion this, uh, this CTI summit. Uh, it was kind of the, the big thing for a little bit. Um, but honeypots are really interesting, and honeypots can provide a really high signal that can go into your um, CTI program provided you understand what those honeypots are sharing, where the information they're giving you provides value. Throwing a random server on the internet and saying, who tries to SSH into this? I, I don't see a whole lot of value with that. Having an extra database running in my environment that shouldn't have any connections to it and monitoring if anybody tries to connect to it, that's kind of useful. Probably my single favorite thing, though, uh, aside from my own incidents, is peer and sharing communities. Um, one of the things I love about this event, and if you're not taking advantage of it, I urge you to, is finding people who have similar needs, similar problems, similar companies, building relationships, and sharing information with them. I get so much good intelligence from people that I have gotten to know through events like this that face similar problems that I do. The outside perspective, I was talking earlier with uh, Rob Lee. Yeah, hi, Rob. Give me, a, give me a wave. There we go. Um, about the idea of building threat campaigns based not on a single perspective, but based on multiple perspectives with partner organizations. This is a, a must do. And if, you, if you're sitting there going, I don't have a good group of people to reach out to about incidents that I'm seeing, start building those relationships today. Turns out I think we're going to get beer after this, and that's probably a good place to start. Um, yeah, third-party paid intelligence, that's also a thing. I think I'm legally required to say that. So OK, Jamie Oliver, somebody who loves good, fresh ingredients. 
Uh, real food doesn't have ingredients, real food is ingredients. I could say the same thing to you about intelligence. Good threat intelligence is only gonna be as good as the, the ingredients you're able to put in. So understanding where you're pulling data from, how much do you trust it, what can you use it for, is key to being successful in building great threat intel products. Also, just those dreamy eyes. The recipe. At some point, you have all this stuff you've pulled together. You've got tools to manipulate your ingredients. You've got ingredients that are gonna be part of the final dish. How do you put it all together? What's the process component looks like? Um, again, another one of those uh, very abstract ideas. A set of instructions for making something from various ingredients. I'm pretty sure all three of those definitions only had like 10 words between them, and it was something in every one of them. So for ramen, What's the recipe? It's really simple. This is a, a, a pretty straightforward ramen recipe, actually. Uh, bring water to a simmer. A simmer. Uh, I like adding some dried mushrooms and a, a piece of kombu or, or nori, some dried uh, seaweed. Just gives it a nice richness toward the end. Uh, add all the other ingredients, except the noodles, because if you leave those in there for three hours, they'll just kind of disintegrate. Uh, reduce from heat and simmer for about two and a half to three hours. Here's what I will tell you, the longer the better. Because uh, it just keeps getting down into this like concentrated broth, it's fantastic. Uh, and then in the end, prepare the noodles and serve with whatever extras are interesting to you. Pretty straightforward. I will say though, the recipe for threat intelligence is not usually quite as straightforward. It turns out the tools are relatively straight or simple. The, uh, the ingredients, we all kind of have a similar group of ingredients. The process is gonna be very, very different. You've gotta develop what works best for your organization, what works best for your team. And that's gonna be a lot different if you've got 20 people versus you have two. Whether you're dedicated to CTI or whether it's just one of many, many things you do. I'm actually surprised, we've, I think we've only seen the intelligence cycle once or twice today. Good, a good mindset to keep. My preferred recipe though for my threat intelligence is usually based on this model, the, the F3 EAD model. Find, fix, finish, exploit, analyze, disseminate. So over here, we have our incident response piece. What are we gonna look for? Once we've decided, how do we go look for it? Then you respond to it, whether that's removing the adversary from the environment, what have you. Then on the other side, we take all this information that we learned during the incident response piece and build our intel based on it. So exploit is taking that final incident response report and going, what pieces are useful for my threat intelligence group? Analyze is figuring out how that leads to a better final product, whether it's a target package about the adversary, whether it's a new set of indicators, whether it's something you wanna share with somebody else. And then lastly is this disseminate piece. And that may be as simple as sending a report back to your uh, uh, C&D team. It might be working with industry partners or those sharing groups I mentioned. You gotta figure out how this works in your environment, but this provides a really useful and interesting paradigm to work in. Lastly, from a, from a process perspective, I see so many teams who struggle because they don't take the time to learn from their own activities, to, to learn from their own actions. I, I spend almost as much time during an incident writing down the things that are going poorly because I want to have those things for my next set of, of operations. Whether that's, hey, this would have been a lot easier if we would have had this particular type of log, or uh, it was really hard because I didn't know how to transfer information between me and John. Having those lessons and knowing how you can improve yourself moving forward means you stop making the same mistakes multiple times. Lydia Bastianich, I, this, this quote was amazing and I like how it doesn't even mention cooking or anything like that and I think is incredibly important for what we do. That tomorrow's, today's innovation is tomorrow's tradition. Uh, I love the talk that Ryan and Dave gave, taking the, the work that Mark Parsons had done and, and expanding upon it. And I think that speaks to this perfectly, that uh, it's becoming a thing that we expect folks to be able to do. Last piece for this is, is the cooks. And, and I, I, again, I'm stretching the analogy. 
But the cooks, I mean the people. Who are your people who are doing these analyses in your environment? And I think there's three really key things that you can look at about great uh, technicians, whether they're cooks or cyber threat analysts. Um, they consume. Uh, if you w watch the uh, documentary uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, he talks about how important it is that he takes all of his cooks to really good meals. Uh, you, you never think of this in most American restaurants, like no one's taking everybody at Pizza Hut to a really good Italian pizza place so they understand what better pizza's like. But, but at Jiro's, they go to the other great sushi places in Tokyo. They go eat good ramen. He wants his cooks to understand what great food tastes like, what good technique looks like. They grow by, by taking in what other people are doing. We can do the same thing. I don't work in ICS environments or banking environments, but I read reports on both of them simply because I get to see what good reports look like. I get to see what good analysis looks like. I get to learn what works and what doesn't. By the way, PDFs that are actually just images and I can't copy and paste from, that doesn't work, stop it. <sighs> the next piece though is great cooks cook. Make things. If you wanna, people ask me a lot, how do I get better at cyber threat intelligence or malware analysis or memory analysis? Do it, build it. You wanna know how to, you wanna learn how to make a better threat intel product? Build one and let someone you think knows what good intel products look like tear it apart. It is, it is an ego blasting thing, but it will make you better. We see this a lot, again, with, with the great cooks. It's an important thing. You, you'll see, uh, there's, there's a, a thing called a stage, which is when a up and coming chef goes and starts working in other people's kitchens. And sometimes they're paid like minimum wage, but, but even still, most of the chefs who are on stages will go to multi-hundred dollar dinners. And it's not some kind of luxury to get to have a really nice meal. It's because going and eating the food of somebody else makes a huge difference. The same thing with creating food. And both of those feed the idea that great chefs are always trying to learn and it should be the same thing for us. The second I hear someone in CTI, incident response, any of these things tell me, I think I've got it. I know you don't got it. I know you don't know what's going on. We are, we are blessed and cursed with an interesting set of problems where there is an intelligent adversary on the other side who is trying to be where we're not, who is trying to do the thing we haven't thought of. And that means if we don't continue learning, we can't keep getting better because I will tell you the adversaries are learning. And we teach them every time we respond to them. We need to do the same thing. There's a great Yiddish proverb, um, listen to your enemies for God is speaking. That, that means a lot for us. Uh, Anand, I knew I was gonna trip over this, um, has, a, has a great quote about this. Uh, cook, 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 keep your hands as involved in the kitchen and as much as you can and don't seek glamour. Um, that's another tough one for this. And by the way, a really ironic thing for the guy on stage to be saying. But be humble, keep working, be hungry. So finally, th those pieces all come together and what do we get? Well, that's my ramen. That's what I make. Anybody hungry? Okay, yeah, thank you. It's pretty good, it's, it's, it's really good. Um, what about for intelligence products though? What's the outputs we can build look like? Um, there was a, Michael had a great talk earlier about RFIs and about building requirements. Uh, I, I think of these as kind of the amuse-bouche of the Intel world, a quick little uh, does, this, does this meet the need kind of thing, a, a request for intelligence. On the other side we have short form products, things that, that get done in a particular case. They you know, tend to be a one or two page thing. They're answering a specific problem in a little bit of depth. Uh, generally speaking, for, from my perspective, most Intel teams are gonna spend a lot of their time on these. And then finally, we have the big products, the stuff that takes a long time, that you have to build a team to work on, that takes effort and new collection requirements and multiple processes. And that reminds me a lot of a Thanksgiving dinner. 
where you're taking the time to bring in a lot of ingredients, a lot of tools with a big ultimate goal. So in the end, think about your tools, understand your inputs, your ingredients, and know what they mean and how you can use them most effectively. Um, much like cooking, confusing inputs can make a huge difference. Has anybody ever used mint when they meant to use basil? Okay. Your spaghetti sauce is not great after that, I'm just saying. Um, knowing your inputs is important. Uh, keep building and growing your processes. Get better at the ones you have, and once you're good at the processes, try to improve the processes themselves. And then finally, and I think most importantly, spend the time, grow your people, grow yourself. Get better at this thing. Again, the second, the second we start thinking we've got it, we, we have a handle on it, we're falling behind. So with that, here is my recipe. I'm gonna put this up here for about 10 seconds in case you wanna take a picture. It's delicious. Uh, this is actually based on the ramen recipe from a DC chef, Eric Bruner Yang. Uh, he opened a restaurant called Toki Underground. Uh, this is his uh, one pot ramen. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.